This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good morning and welcome to Asian Review. I'm your host, Lily Ong. Today we have with us Mr. Bill Borum, Chairman Emeritus of Sister Cities International. Welcome to the show, Mr. Bill. I'm very happy to be here. Happy to be back in Hawaii, I can tell you that. Why are you in Hawaii today? Well, we're having, having a conference here to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the founding of Fort Elizabeth on the south shore of Kauai. So I'm joining with other people who will make that um, observance and make some comments upon it and interpret uh, what the history, the culture, etc. Mm -hmm. And who are these other people that's going to be here today? Well, there will be uh, scholars on history and culture, of course. And then there'll be members of different departments of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and then also uh, various uh, non-governmental organizations here in the United States. So each having a view of uh, the events that uh, transpired mm -hmm. 200 years ago. And how long has this be, uh, event been in a planning? I think quite a, quite a number of months. I was invited a couple of months ago to come here. Very happy to do so. Uh, and I think there's, it's been a very good coming together, again, of different uh, non-governmental organizations in the U.S. and also uh, working with uh, Russian government officials and NGOs. And what can we expect to happen at this event today? Well, there'll be presentations by quite a few people. There's uh, a number of speakers, probably uh, 12 plus, and we've got different segments during the course of the day. So they'll make their presentations. We'll have Q&A and then some open discussion. So I think it'll be uh, a very good program. And I hope that a number of the locals have registered that can listen in as well as make comments to us. And who are some of the VIPs we can expect to be in attendance today? Well, I have the list right here. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't remembered it as yet. <clears throat> but the mayor will be here. Right. The mayor of Kauai, mm -hmm. very important person. Mm -hmm. So um, I look forward to meeting him. Yeah. What about from the Russian side? Is the Russian ambassador going to be here? No, the Russian ambassador will not be here. But I, numbered, I know that his number two out of the embassy in Washington will be here. So that's significant. And then, as I said, also people from uh, Moscow. Mm -hmm. Well, wonderful. Well, Bill, you, you're a chairman emeritus at Sister Cities International. Could you tell us more about the organizing? How, how did it come about? Well, it came about uh, from a uh, conference that President Eisenhower had in 1956, September 11th, no less. In any event, he said that uh, people, people throughout the world are interested in peace. So he gave inspiration to uh, the American people to form partnerships with other cities, and this is all through the city channel. So it started with Eisenhower, and we've been at it for now more than 60 years, and we've got um, over 2,000 uh, affiliations of U.S. cities around the world. So um, how has um, Sister Cities International today continue to foster this vision of Preston Eisenhower? Well, we have, one thing, we have annual conferences, so we, we have um, topics that are of current interest. Uh, within our organization, Washington, we have an online capability called City Seeking Cities. So anyone on either side, whether they're a foreign city or someone in the U.S. looking for a city in the other direction, uh, can look and see who may be registered, kind of like a bridal registry, if you will. So we are pairing people pairing communities. And do you go beyond the initial <coughs> link up? Uh, we do. You know, we provide a lot of information for the original link up, uh, standard kinds of uh, agreements, etc. But the annual conference and other programs that we have um, sustain and support the activities of all these many partnerships around the world. So we're constantly at that. We have a um, board of directors of 25 people from across the U.S. And uh, so they give us a good channel of communication with um, the cities around the U.S. And then, of course, we also have the state representatives, a very important group. And uh, they uh, act between the office and the board to the cities within their states. And this time, for the first time right now, uh, for the first time in many years, 
we have all 50 states covered, including Hawaii. So we're very proud of that. Wonderful. Now, is, are your services available to anybody that just go to your website and, and you know, let's say A City is looking for B City, <coughs> or do they have to become a member of your organization? They don't have to become a member initially. We encourage that. So the services are for free. That's a good question. Certainly people can call into the office or contact a state representative if they know who that is. So the initial can be for free, but of course if they want to participate, well, they even don't have to be a member to be at the conference. So, but it's good if you are a member, then you have access to a wider scope of information. And what takes place um, during these <coughs> annual conferences? Well, again, we have uh, what we might call best practices sessions, as well as informational sessions, and networking sessions as well. So there's a variety of types of sessions that are conducted. And then, very importantly, we have the award ceremony. And this recognizes uh, particular achievements of a city committee. And it's ranked by, um, uh, you might say, size of city by the population. So this uh, in humanitarian, youth and education, economic development, all of those cities are recognized within size category. So they come up on the stage, receive their award, and make some nice comments. And can any city apply to participate in this award, or well, do you have to be a member? Well, yeah, they, uh, you have to be a member to be considered for an award, because it is recognizing the achievements of our members. And how far in advance do they have to submit their application to be considered? <coughs> well, I think that could be probably three or four months in advance. Uh, I don't forget exactly what the deadline is. But it's so that their information can be submitted and can be considered by the vetting panel. Mm -hmm. And what is the percentage of foreign attendees in these um, annual conferences? Yes. Well, it varies from year to year, frankly, depending on where it is. But it may be as many as 25%. We've always wanted to have more. Sometimes we have, but we get good participation. We always seem to have a good participation from uh, African city committees. And what about the governmental representation? How, how, um, what's the percentage of attendees that come from government background? Well, it's, uh, we're basically talking mayors here because it's city to city. That's probably 10% um, or less. We've always wanted more mayors to come. But they're busy people, too. They've got a lot of meetings to go to, both within their city and otherwise. Uh, and we're looking, actually, next year, and we've considered it in the past, to have uh, meetings concurrent with the U.S. League of Cities so that uh, it'll be convenient for the mayors to also come to our conference concurrently. So a little bit of uh, logistical issues there, because mayors are busy people. Could you tell us more about the U.S. League of Cities? Well, that's an organization. There are two of them. That's one. And uh, basically, the city is a member. And somewhat similar to what we do, they, they have this uh, annual conference. They also have a staff, uh, which provides information. It's about best practices in city government. So that's mainly what it is. So they'll have, and it's all run by the mayors. Uh, you know, it's a, a whole elective process. So it's something which I think most cities in the U.S do belong to. It's a very worthwhile organization. And we've attended their conferences in the past with representatives. Do we have any mayors that are serving on uh, Sister Cities International Board or in the committee? <coughs> we do. Uh, the one fellow that we're quite proud of is Ron Nirenberg, who is a city council member in San Antonio. And just a few months ago, he was elected the mayor of San Antonio, ninth largest city in the United States. So he was elected uh, as mayor, but he also he's, uh, was elected as vice chair of Sister Cities International, which means that next July, he would become the chairman of the board of directors. Uh, we have a number of other people. Uh, for example, there's um, Magdalena Carrasco, who's the vice mayor of San Jose, California. So from time to time, we do have council members and mayors that serve on the board of directors or on our honorary board. In fact, uh, another official that we have who's not a mayor, he's kind of like a mayor, is the uh, <clears throat> president of the Board of Supervisors uh, of uh, Santa Clara County in California. That's a very high-level position. Wonderful. Do you work closely with the State Department? 
We do work very closely with the State Department, and I'm happy to say that in recent, uh, during the last year or two, we've worked even more closely with the State Department. We have always received a relatively small amount of funding from the State Department, and therefore you want to have good liaison with the State Department. Uh, just go across town from Washington and meet with them periodically. We have to give them financial reports and activity reports, but also members of the State Department uh, do come to our conferences and speak about uh, matters of interest uh, to our members. And what kind of support do they render other than coming to our conferences and providing a small amount of funding? Well, I think that's um, uh, the most that they would want to do and the most that we would expect them to do, to speak as, as authorities on certain topics. Uh, so we're very happy with that. We'd be even happier with more money, but Congress is a tough place to do business with. But I must say also that whenever our delegations go overseas, uh, as, and as I do as an individual, we visit at the local consulate, try to get appointments there, uh, visit at the embassy of the country to let them know that we're in country, what we're doing. I was at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow actually less than two weeks ago, meeting with a, cult, with a public affairs officer. So it's an important thing that we visit with these uh, embassies and consulates of the United States overseas. And I would say that in almost all cases, uh, these people know of sister cities and know about the work that we do. Uh, a greater challenge is to uh, try to find their support in some way for our work so that they could uh, support f through funding and otherwise exhibitions of culture, of U.S. culture in the foreign country. So we're establishing deeper support with the State Department and I know that they welcome it. Could you give us some uh, more notable examples of achievements and activities between the different sister cities, say in uh, educational, <coughs> economic, municipal, or cultural exchanges? Right. Well, there's um, you know many different types of activities, as you say, ranging from the humanitarian, where we might support um, a simple thing, such as uh, making water more available, clean water, installing pumps, that type of thing. Uh, on the educational area, we facilitate the exchange of students. Uh, they're able to come over to the U.S., stay for two weeks with a family, and then the next year or a year after, that U.S. family and the U.S. City Committee will go over and stay with the people over there. Does SCA help with facilitating the process of the <coughs> F-1 visas as well? Um, it does. We have a, well actually we call it a, a J visa, as I re remember. Uh, and we, we have set up a, a separate channel to do that. We used to outsource it. Now we're doing it ourselves in order to do it as a lower cost to our city members. So we do facilitate that. And what we about, welcome more business. Mm -hmm. What about students who plan <coughs> on coming here for school, do you, you know, not just for a month or two, but yeah. for long term? Do, does SEI help with you know, the, those kind of applications as well? Well, I think that's been more in the province of the local city committees that do that because if they've identified and working well with a local university, uh, they will help facilitate those enrollment types of you know, programs for a year or something like that. So that also goes on. Um, I'm starting to do some work in that area myself, uh, trying to identify some uh, cities in um, Russia and universities in Russia that we can uh, have some longer term exchanges with. Um, I'm a numbers person. Could you oh. provide some economic numbers, you know, that have transpired, <coughs> you know, that they are the fruits of this kind of exchanges? Well, um, I can't think of, 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 of I'm, I'm glad you're a numbers person. <laughs> <laughs> Off the top of my head, it's still early in the morning. Need that first cup of coffee. And your jet lag too. <laughs> that's right. So I can't remember the exact numbers, uh, but um, uh, that's something which we need to do more of, you know, compile the numbers. There's a lot going on. That, you know, this is an organization of 600 city committees with over 2,000 partnerships. Very difficult to keep track of all of those activities. We'd rather have them continue to be active and do things rather than to bother them with, you know, leaning on them for a lot of reporting. So it's spontaneous and local. Well, with modern technology and, you know, communications methods, um, 
if, if I want to contact somebody in country Exotica, I could almost just reach over over the internet to, you know, to get to know <coughs> them. So what kind of added advantage or unique tools and resources does SCI have to facilitate that kind of development? Right. Well, if one person tries to contact one person or a city overseas, I think it's difficult. I mean, you can identify, but to actually establish contact, they don't know who you are. They think they're okay. maybe it's an internet scam mm -hmm. of some type. We have the reputation around the world in 150 countries. So we have this reputation, and uh, the foreign ministries know of us. A lot of people <clears throat> in capital cities and other cities know of us. So we are an entree. We're like a passport to connections around the world so we can pave the way. And being a non-governmental organization, you're sort of doing track two diplomacy. What are some of the things that track two diplomacy can accomplish that track one cannot? Well, the human element is the real difference here. And again, that it's from the American people. It's not from the government, from the U.S. government or, or U.S. agencies. So I think the human element is the most important part. And uh, ours is a volunteer work. Uh, people who go, who go on these missions, these exchanges, are doing it uh, on their own time, on their own expense. And uh, I think that kind of willingness to be of help or to be collaborative, really, uh, is welcomed abroad. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Bowen. We're so glad to have you here with us in Hawaii today, and we hope you enjoy your stay. Thank, thank you very much, and I hope they have another meeting here in Hawaii soon. <laughs> thank you. Well, good morning. Could you tell us your name, please? My name's Natalie Sabelnik. And who are you with today? Well, I'm the president of the Congress of Russian Americans, and we're one of the organizers of this event, the Fort Elizabeth 200th commemoration. And who can we expect to be in attendance today? Well, we are now waiting for Mayor Carvalho. We actually have the head of the, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russia, we have the head of the Department of Work with Compatriots Abroad. We actually have the Minister um, Counselor from the Embassy, and we will have the Consul General of Russian Federation from Seattle, who covers the California and Hawaii territory. And of course, a lot of speakers, historians, academics, and so we're very excited. So, yeah. is your organization the event planner? Uh, I'm sorry. Is your organization the the one that planned this whole event? Uh, well, I would say that we are uh, one of the initial uh, organizers, but we are doing this in collaboration with, we're in partnership with the Russian Center New York, so Elena Branson, the president of the Russian Center, and the Novosibirsk um, uh, University, State University of uh, Architecture, Design and Arts, and Alexander Molodin. Uh, is the uh, winner of the prestigious award from the uh, Hawaiian Historic Foundation for his reconstruction e efforts of the fort. And how long has um, you guys been planning this event? Well, I've been planning it since 1994, since the first time I've seen it. But Elena and I got together a couple of years ago and said we need to do this while it's 200 years. And then last year we had a conference and we invited some people uh, in Washington, D.C. and one of them was um, head of the department on work with uh, uh, cons conservation uh, in North America of uh, landmarks and so we thought this this if we don't do it this year that's it. Well 1994 that's a long time ago what were some of the obstacles you faced in trying to bring about this event? In, in 1994 was my first visit to Kauai and my first visit to Fort Elizabeth which I was not aware of being Russian, but I also found out that a lot of Hawaiians, even living here, are not aware of this. And so I kept thinking, how do we do this? How do we restore it, preserve it? And so everything just kept coming to, I guess it was like a crescendo and it just occurred. And so we're very fortunate that we were able to do that. What is the history be behind our Fort Russian Elizabeth? Well, the history behind it, and I guess it starts with the Russian-American company. Um, it, it, as you know, they were in Alaska, and they moved down to California, Fort Ross, I would say is the sister um, uh, fort to Fort Elizabeth. Um, and the, traveling further down, um, in 1806, the Russian-American company came to Honolulu. 
So we're very fortunate today, too, to have a speaker who was on um, the commission uh, investigation. They found the first ship that came in, the Niva, they found the, the wreckage of it. So that's something that's happening. So in, um, I think it was 1815, the Russian-American company came to Kauai. And so there was an alliance with King Kaumali. And so I think that's how it just all started. In 1817 was when they left. And so this is the last year that we were able to use this as a commemoration. Well, uh, what are some of the things you hope to happen from this event? That well, I would say I hope to raise awareness of the fort. I think it's very important that people do know of the shared history. After all, this is a shared history. Uh, I, I hope, well, a shared history also is a shared responsibility, so we hope that somehow we can help in preserving maintenance and maybe do other things to have more people aware of this, not just here, but from all over the world, because that's going to increase Kauai's tourism. <laughs> So I, I just I think that's it, and then it, I think U.S.-Russia relations is, is a key thing here too. Uh, Hawaiian-Russian relations. I think there's a win-win situation all around. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Natalie, and thank you for your efforts in bringing about this event. Thank oh, you. And one more thing, it's a sister city. We're hoping that we will find some sister city opportunities. So I thank you for your help with this too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Hey, good morning. Could you let us know what your name is, please? My name is uh, Malginov. I'm coming from Moscow. I'm working in the Foreign Ministry of the Russian Federation, and I'm the head of the department, which is working uh, for, the, for the ties with our Russians abroad. Did you just arrive here today? Well, not today. Yesterday, late evening. Is this your first time to Hawaii? Yes, that's right. <laughs> but this is not time. I came here only for one day. I'm afraid I will not be in a position to see Hawaii. So I will have to come uh, another. Uh, you have to come. Again. Yes, of course. Yes. And right. What you hope? What do you? What do you hope to achieve from this trip? Well, for us, uh, the event is rather important. Uh, important because uh, um, because of the initiatives of the Russians staying in the United States, especially the Congress of Russian Americans. Uh, they are trying to bring back and to show to a wider American public the long history of relations between our two countries. You can imagine that 200 years ago already in various parts of the present United States there were Russian settlements. It was in Alaska, it was in Fort Dross in California and here in Hawaii. And uh, this is very interesting that uh, for 200 years uh, our countries, our countries and our people uh, did learn each other. Uh, these pages of history we must not forget because our memory has to be preserved because you cannot build future without uh, deep knowledge of your past. And uh, that's good that in the United States, American people, enthusiasts, are trying to preserve the history as a whole. Yeah? Because the history of the United States is the history of a very complex uh, infiltration of cultures, languages, peoples, and so on and so forth. So, and Russians uh, were one of them. You cannot imagine uh, American culture, American history without the uh, influence of the uh, people coming from the Russian Federation. As I said, 200 years ago and the 20th century, if you look about Rachmaninoff and Stravinsky, Sikorsky and some other names. So uh, let's try to uh, uh, remember and let's try to preserve this rich history because this may be a foundation for future relations and understanding between the people. And the uh, more we remember about our, our relations of the past, it will be more difficult to destroy it. And you know that uh, there are certain th uh, influences trying to destroy the relations, so it will be more easier to preserve it for the future, for future generations. Is this piece of history, this special piece of history, known to Russians back in Russia? 
Well, you see, not very much, believe me. And uh, about the history of uh, Russian settlements in Hawaii, I learned only just a couple of years ago. I knew, of course, about Alaska, I knew about California, we knew about the expedition of Rizanov. But Hawaii, no, it was, for me at least, it was very interesting and uh, very innovative. And I'm very grateful to enthusiasts here in uh, the United States and as well as for enthusiasts in the Russian Federation. Historians, they're trying to bring it back. So had history taken a different turn, this could have been the Russia Republic of Hawaii. I doubt. It's a little bit too far. <laughs> That is a bit too far. But ha had that happened, how do you think Hawaii would look like today? Sorry? Uh, had that happened, had we become a Russian Republic of Hawaii, how do you think Hawaii would look like today in terms well, of... Being working in the foreign ministry, I would say that uh, the history doesn't have subjunctive mood. So it's not like this. <laughs> it's very difficult to imagine. <laughs> Let uh, historians, uh, experts and uh, writers just try to create something, uh, fiction, some fiction about this. For me, it's rather difficult. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Marginov. Thank you so okay, much. Okay. Yeah, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Enjoy bye. your stay here. But thank you. And I wish all the best to Hawaiian people uh, to prosper, to expand the tourist uh, uh, inflow, and I hope that uh, Russian um, history of Hawaiians will also in uh, um, will permit more tourists even from the Russian Federation to come here to learn and to see this. That sounds wonderful. I believe I'm hearing talks about setting up a sister city relationship with Russia already. Yeah. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good morning, sir. Could you tell us your name, please? My name is Dmitry Zhernov. I'm a minister counselor in the embassy of the Russian Federation and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I think that uh, we're going to have a very important event which should be, not, not, not even could be, but should be and will be conducive to strengthening of our relations. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Thank sir. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Morning. I'm with Team Think Tech Hawaii oh, and we're okay. so happy to have you here today. Yeah. Um, could you tell us what are some of the goals and aspirations you see from this event? Well, I'm hoping that we can develop a stronger bond. I know we tried to do a sister city uh, relationship kind of agreement because the connection here is the Russian fort and this is what 200th anniversary so I'm hoping we can develop some solid relationships and really connect culturally and understand the presence of the fort, um, Russian fort here on Kauai and what it means and it's about relationships right culture exchanges internships I enjoy talking about that and what are the steps to, um, to um, growing a sister series relationship, what are the process to it? Right, so I we've been trying and so we'll continue to try, go through the right process, but I, I would like to connect back to whoever's the mayor there, I mean whatever the leadership there, and begin the discussion from my office, working with a county council, there's a process and so I think maybe from today we can actually see each other. Sometimes it's not about just emailing and the tech part of it, which is great, the relationship, the eye-to-eye -eye contact, so hopefully we can do that today and solidify some of the process that's going to take for us to finally do a sister city with Russia.